Anyway, um, according to my clock, it's just turned um, four o'clock. We've got about 36 people on the call so far, which is absolutely brilliant. And uh, so glad that uh, you've all come in to, uh, to listen to Marika. So let me introduce her to you and then um, she will take over and, uh, and tell you all that she wants to tell you. So um, I obviously met Marika, I'm gonna do it like that, um, virtually when she became a member of Super Troopers. And like a lot of you that I could, whose names I can see up in the top of my screen here, you have become familiar names and faces to me. And um, obviously you have been sharing uh, various aspects of your life with us. And um, I've been fascinated to read various things that uh, Marika has posted. So um, when I had this idea of a Trisha talk, which is um, the idea of which is that there's something that you are passionate about, passionate about in your life that you'd really love to talk about and perhaps share with other people. Um, I thought of something that Marika posted a, a few weeks ago about uh, her involvement with um, a very special place in southwest Uganda. So I contacted her and said, you know, we need to kick this thing off and get it going really well. So um, how about it? And she was brilliant in responding positively to it and, uh, and saying, yes, she'd have a go. So thank you so much, Marika, for volunteering to do that because somebody had to start. And uh, it's always hard to be the first in lots of ways. Now the way that we're going to run this is that Marika is going to talk for to, uh, um, to us about, uh, about lots of different things um, for about 20 minutes or so and if you would like to ask her a question about anything that she's talking about could you perhaps use the chat function below and type in your question Bryony will be um, watching those and she'll be picking those up so I'll stop rabbiting on and um and say welcome to you marika thank you for coming and doing this for us and over to you right hello everybody my name's marika derrington um thanks trisha for uh, introducing me i live in manchester uh, with my husband richard and we have uh, four children four daughters uh, who all live fairly locally uh, which is lovely um, because it means that I have been able to get to see them during the last seven months of lockdown, either walking the park or uh, cycling past the house and waving at them from the end of the garden. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about me and my, my journey initially into midwifery, because that's where my involvement with the Potter's Village started. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about Potter's Village and how that was set up and put it also in context why it's so important in that part of Uganda. So, um, yes, I'm in Manchester. I was born in Holland, which is where my name comes from. My mum was Dutch, uh, but I moved to the UK when I was a baby still and was brought up in the Southeast, uh, which is where my sister was born. And if she knows what's good for her, she will also be watching because she's also a super trooper. <laughs> Hello, Fenneke. Um, I had what you know a, a very ordinary, very happy childhood, but things changed radically or drastically in 1970 when my dad died. I was 14, Ben was 13, and my mum was only 41. But being the amazingly brave, courageous, imaginative, creative woman that she was, she still made our lives fun and you know, I look back on my childhood with really, really fond memories. I came to Manchester in 1974 to study landscape architecture because I thought it sounded interesting. It wasn't really where my heart was. And um, after four years of study and 14 years of working as a landscape architect, I finally came to realise that actually landscape architecture was not what I was cut out to be. When I started my second family, I decided to take a break from work. And I was at home with my children for eight years, during which time I became involved with a lot of other women who were having babies or had young children. And I realized that a lot of them hadn't come out of that whole process feeling well, happy, and as though they were the most amazing woman on the planet, which is what I had felt. And so 
as it got near the time when my youngest daughter was about to start nursery and I was thinking well you know what am I going to do with the rest of my life I could carry on being an NCT antenatal teacher I could carry on running a postnatal support group I could carry on running a toddler group but I felt I had more to give and then a, an NCT colleague who was also a midwife took me aside one day and said, had I considered training to be a midwife? And I thought, oh, yes, but I thought it was my hormones. So I dismissed it um, because it, was, it sounded like far too much hard work, much too much uh, for me to think about. But that seed was planted and it grew very, very quickly. And before I knew it, I'd applied to Manchester University and been accepted to train as a midwife. And I felt I'd come home. It was as though everything that, 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 was, that was me, everything I felt I was good at, everything that I enjoyed doing, all came together in being a midwife. Um, it was largely, I think, primarily my passion for women and make, wanting to make things better for them that was the, the, the main driver for me going into midwifery. So in 1999, I started a three year degree at Manchester University. I was 43. Um, my youngest daughter was, was four and uh, my oldest daughter was in her late teens. Um, and it was a very, very hard transition and journey. But I did it, came out the other side, qualified as a midwife, worked first in a large teaching hospital in the centre of Manchester with all the adherent um, sort of risk factors and interesting uh, clientele, I suppose you could say, but really found my niche as a community midwife in Stockport, which is about five miles southeast of Manchester. And I spent the following 13 years working as a community midwife, home births. My passion was really for antenatal and the postnatal side and making women proud and confident and happy parents. Um, it was a demanding job and one that my arthritic knees and shoulders started complaining about quite a lot and in 2016 I decided to retire partly because of that but also my mum was becoming unwell and my sister and I realised that she needed more support, which I couldn't give her living so far away um, and having to work within a, a shift system. So I retired on the 1st of April. Sadly, my mum was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer in the May. My sister and I were with her and we spent her final five weeks with her in her home, um, supported by amazing Marie Curie carers and she died in June. Um, so suddenly my retirement looked very different to what I'd envisaged. But as any of you know who, who lost a parent, uh, there's always a lot of sorting out to do after um, somebody dies. And so that kept me busy for a good several months. And I came out the other side and I thought, now what? What, what, what am I going to do with myself? I still felt I had a lot to give and I was, already volunteering two or three days a week for um, two different um, community cafes. But I felt I needed a challenge. I needed something to take me out of myself, out of my comfort zone and, and to challenge me a bit. And I know that my mum would have been behind me because it was the sort of thing she would have done. And it was about that time that I heard about the Potter's Village which is um, a, a charity that was set up in 2007 by um, a woman called Jenny Green, who was a, a Christian youth pastor in that part of Uganda. And she saw um, the awful plight of babies that had been abandoned at birth and decided to set up a home to give these babies the best chance of thriving and to try and find somewhere for them to go, whether it was 
with members of their extended family or a foster family or being adopted you know, out of the area. Um, the, there was a group of people from our church who uh, supported the charity. Several of them were trustees and they went out to Potter's Village every couple of years. And it just so happened that they were planning a trip at the beginning of 2018. And what particularly caught my attention was the fact that they had recently opened a small maternity unit. So from the small beginnings of a home for abandoned babies, they'd also developed a, a medical center with a special care baby unit attached, the only one in the whole of the region. And then that led on to the development of a little maternity unit. And when I expressed an interest in you know, possibly joining them, uh, the group said, that would be fantastic, it's just what we need. And suddenly I had 10 months of planning and thinking about and collecting bits and pieces ready for my trip to Africa. I'd never been to Africa before. Uh, it was well and truly outside my comfort zone. I had to take malar anti-malarial medication. I had to have a raft of vaccinations. I had no idea what sort of accommodation I'd be going to, um, but I was ready for the challenge and the group that I went with were fantastically supportive. So I'd, I'll just put the Potter's Village, the maternity unit and, and in context a little bit. Um, Uganda is a very large country and there are incredibly wide differences in health, healthcare provision, wealth and education, you know, depending on where you go in Uganda. The southwest corner of Uganda, which is literally only maybe a half an hour's drive from the border with Rwanda and Congo, is amongst the, the poorest areas of the country. Um, it's a long way from central government in Kampala and you do sometimes get the feeling that it's forgotten about. It's very rural, um, extremely poor. There's also very little education um, and medical facilities are few and far between. The infant or uh, maternal and infant mortality in the country is very high. Uh, Uganda ranks 11th out of 183 countries for women dying in childbirth. And that equates to approximately 350 women for every 100,000 births. And for each one of those 350 women, six other women will be left with chronic and debilitating health issues. So it's a, an enormous problem, um, not just because of babies having to, su having to survive without a mother, but also because of the plight of those women who are so badly damaged by birth that they can no longer maybe look after their families or work on the land. The reasons they die are what would be easily present preventable in this country. Hemorrhage, unsafe abortions, uh, sepsis, and then we've got the added complications of you know, malaria, untreated diabetes, untreated anemia, and, and things like this. As far as babies and infants are concerned, and an infant is, you know, for, for research purposes and, and statistics, a child under the age of five, um, Uganda ranks 11th in the, the stakes of you know, how many di babies die or how many infants die. And again, of those infants that die, approximately 55 out of every thousand babies will die, either in infancy, either as 
newborns or before their fifth birthday. And again, those numbers are higher in the rural areas where they are often born to very young mothers with no education, no access to healthcare, um, no support during labour and birth. And you know, one of the ideas about uh, the small maternity unit was to provide that support for these women who couldn't afford to go to, um, uh, to access the, the more expensive care um, that would provide a sort of a drop-in facility uh, where they could get not just support for the pregnancy, malarial tablets, uh, anti-worming tablets, uh, iron tablets, have their babies gross and heartbeat checked, but also educate them about how to, how themselves to tell if their baby inside them is, is growing well and is, is healthy. Um, because you did get the feeling that the women had very little knowledge, very little understanding. Um, and you just thought, oh, you know, they're, they're being raised in, a, in a, a society where women are having babies and breastfeeding all around them, but they don't really know what's going on. They don't really know what's going on inside them at all. Um, and so this is education role of the midwife is just so crucially important, not just for the pregnancy, but also for caring for their newborn babies. Some of, there are some absolutely appalling practices uh, done to babies in the name of making them better, which results in overwhelming infection and, and ultimately death. Um, but being able to talk to women that, about what to do if they think their baby is ill, and one of the most awful things is what, what we call a ton, tonsil mutilation, which is where a baby's tonsils are removed without anaesthetic, without any sterile equipment because they're seen as the cause of the illness. And what happens to that baby is the baby will become very, very ill with a horrendous infection. And often by the time help is sought, it's too late. And, you know, during my three visits to Potters in the last three years, you know, I've, I've seen that happen. And the tragedy is that those mothers who've lost a baby that way, you'd have thought, oh, they won't let it happen again, but they will, because these young mothers are so under the influence of their mothers and their mothers-in-law. But what we have to hope is that those young mothers, when they become the grandmother and the grandmother-in-law, that they will be able to support their children in not going down this, this route. Um, how am I doing for time? Oh, I've got no time at all. <laughs> do you want, can I go on a bit longer or do you want you to ask? Got, you're absolutely fine, yes. Yeah. Um, do you tell us um, about, you know, your visits to Potters and the kind of things that you got involved in? Because we're really interested in that. All right. Well, um, the, the group that I go with, um, several of them are from a medical background, we've got um, a consultant in infectious diseases, we've had a consultant paediatrician, children's nurse, some retired GPs, um, an engineer taking annual leave, a solicitor, a judge, uh, a teacher, you know, across the board. But and basically, we all get involved in whatever is needed. So um, typically, uh, the day will start for those of us with a medical bent around seven o'clock and we get up and have a very simple breakfast at the hostel where we stay and we walk three quarters of a mile down to the Potter's Village in time for handover from the night staff to the day staff and the ward round and that's always really interesting to see you know what's happened overnight, um, who's been brought in, how the babies are doing, um, uh, the, the ward round often takes two, two and a half hours, but I usually duck out of that. Um, the antenatal clinic is about 100 yards away from the, the, you know, the, 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 the main medical centre. And women just turn up um, and they don't mind waiting for hours to see a midwife. 
Um, Mondays and Thursdays are especially busy because it's market day, so they try and combine things. And so it might be that I would be doing um, a, a couple of antenatal appointments. And I saw the opportunities there because I don't speak any of the dialects and there are so many different dialects spoken there. But what I could do was spend time with the midwives, um, suggesting ways in which they could really in increase the impact or the effect of, of their contact with the women, um, the things that they could talk about. And it was interesting that none of them asked the mother whether their baby moved, whether their baby was moving. And the stillbirth rate in Uganda is very, very high. That runs at about, um, it's about 55 out of every thousand babies is stillborn. Um, so that's uh, really quite staggering. Um, so we might have two or three antenatals in the morning. Um, everything stops for lunch in Uganda and uh, the Potter's Village is no exception. So the women will usually come with a friend or family member or other children and they'll crack open their little pots of bean stew and the staff will at Potter's will all be fed by the kitchen and it's always the same. It's beans, potatoes and groundnut sauce, which is the most amazing pink. A bit like that, the light pink in the cushion behind you, Tricia. Um, a little bit of an obstacle to get over that one. In the afternoon, some if there were more antenatals, I would be involved with that. Um, I, you know, I have been lucky to have been at several births as well. Um, and that's just a question of women arriving in advanced labour and, and you know getting them into a into the little room um, and what was really quite interesting because you have this image in your head or this idea that in a in in a rural sort of developing country childbirth is really natural and women just do their own thing but the midwives who have very little training in Uganda try and impose a sort of western sort of approach to, 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 to looking after women in labour. So they're desperately trying to get the women onto the bed so that they can monitor them. But these women are, are wanted to move around and change positions. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, quite, it's quite different. And as, as a midwife who was always primarily involved with normal midwifery, home births and supporting the natural process, I didn't often deliver women on the bed. They were usually on the floor or in the bath or on a staircase or something. So it was very interesting to see how sort of rigidly the midwives there wanted their women to behave. So, you know, I'd spent quite a lot of time talking to them about how that they could support the women, not on the couch. Um, and we, we had some lovely babies. Um, and what also made me smile was one of the girls who had her first baby. She was only 17. Um, it was a really grueling and quite a long labour. And that baby needed quite a lot of resuscitation, which, you know, I, I did together with um, one of the other members of the group who was a retired GP. And the woman had quite extensive um, needlework done. Um, afterwards but the following day she was skipping across the grass and itching itch, itching to leave and I just thought that's so different because you know we're sort of creeping around and you know little steps and all the rest of just but they're incredibly resilient and courageous women um, um, so you, I just feel I want they need they want they need they deserve so much more um and i really do feel that a, you know a midwife is such an important part of what the service at potters provides to that community if if there was nothing going on in the maternity unit i would be painting walls um cleaning out storerooms sorting through the shed where all the donated clothing is kept um playing with babies in the crisis centre. The crisis centre houses, can house up to 18 babies in two separate um, 
homes. Uh, each baby has a named carer and a second carer. Uh, and the ratio is probably about you know, two babies to one carer. And the interesting thing was that, well, the interesting thing is that Ugandan women are not, don't know how to play with a child. So when they set up Potters and the crisis centre, the carers who they brought in had to be taught how to play. And so a, a large part, a large portion of what we took out with us when, when I went earlier this year were toys. Um, but then often you know, you'd give the carer one of the toys and she wouldn't know what to do with it. So you know, we had to show them, oh, press these buttons. Is that because they, um, the children are sort of left outside to their own devices and the women just get on with what they're doing and the, the children kind of play with each other? Is that, yes. is that how the yes, society absolutely. works? Um, newborns spend most of the time on their mother's backs um, and the really only face-to-face -face contact they have with their mother is when, they're breastfeed, when, when the baby's breastfeeding. Um, as soon as the baby can walk, they're looked after by other children, whether it's in the extended family or in that little hamlet where they live. So, yeah, um, so that is, is really quite, quite different. When, and, and the other thing that really, really affected me and made me very, very sad was um, visiting the children's ward where children up to the age of 10 are looked after. And often these would be very, very ill children. And the mothers would just sit there and wouldn't interact with them at all. And, you know, I remember when my, one of my daughters was in hospital having her tonsils out. I stayed in the hospital with her. I had special treats for her. I was sitting on the bed with my arm around it, reading stories and, but the women, they just sit there and they don't interact with their children. It, and I just thought that was so sad. Maybe they wanted to, but the society didn't allow it. Yeah. And, and I thought that was very sad. Marika, this is all just brilliant and really, really fascinating. I think we've had a few questions come in. Uh, so, Bryony, up there, um, have you got some questions to ask Marika now yeah. from, from the group? Yeah, lots of questions. And if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. So, um, the first question, Helen wants to know how important has your faith been equipping you uh, in your work and sort of when you go to Potter's Village, the challenges that you have to face there? Um, it very, it's been very, very important. Um, the group that I go out with are all, are all just Christians. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we go out from uh, the point that we're, we're, we're wanting to do good, we're wanting to make a difference. And the strengths that we get from our faith and from the, the community that we formed as a group going out there, means that we can support one another as, as we support potters. And you know, the, uh, there's a very strong Christian ethic running through the whole of, or ethos running through the whole of potters, uh, from the, the doctors down through the nurses to the carers. Um, and, you know, there's an act of worship every week. Uh, and interestingly, at handover and at the beginning of the ward round, there is always a prayer time. So you have the night staff and you've got the incoming day staff and the incoming day staff pray for the night staff and for the day ahead. And that's just a, a really lovely opportunity for the whole of the community to come together. Yeah. Um, and then as a group in the evening, we always used to have a, a time of sharing and praying about our day. And that was also a, a very good time to reflect and you know, be thankful um, and you know, realise that we're in such a privileged position to, to be able to go, to be able to go there. Mm. So yeah, my faith has been very important. And um, Margaret wants to know if you've always had the full support of your family, um, so sort of for what you've done. Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't have done it without it. I mean, I, I had actually wanted to do something like this earlier on, but when I was working and working shifts and had all my children at home, I couldn't justify spending 
two weeks of my precious annual leave and that amount of money on a what some people would have said was a jolly for myself <laughs> you know but um when my mum died I had some additional money um, I was retired all my children had grown up um, when I came home and suggested to my husband that I went on this uh, I went to um, Uganda for two weeks he said to me I take it you're not expecting me to come <laughs> um, because the, the the vagaries of the southwest Ugandan water supply electricity supply and wi-fi and the, the sort of diet just, just doesn't float his boat at all that actually leads me on really nicely to a question from Pat. She'd like to know what the accommodation is like when you're in Uganda. Um, it can be sublime or ridiculous. Unfortunately, we have the sublime end. Um, we stay in a, a, a Christian, it's a, the hostel attached to um, the Kisora Cathedral, which sounds very, very grand, but Kisora Cathedral, Cathedral is basically brick walls with a corrugated iron roof on the top. So the um, the hostel, we each had our own room, um, which was sort of absolutely fine, very, very basic. Uh, you couldn't drink the water. You had to drink only bottled water, even for doing your teeth. Um, the, I had quite a few unwelcome visitors in my room, like praying mantises, <laughs> lizards, and of course the ubiquitous mosquito. But fortunately, where Kisoro is it's quite high up okay. so you're just below the mosquito line mm -hmm. so they weren't that bad and each bed you know we had a mosquito net over us um okay. so it it was um it was challenging at times because you know we're, we're used to turning on a tap and water coming out but it didn't always happen yeah. and you know after a, a day down at Potter's coming back and not being able to have a shower or even a wash um, was was really difficult. Yeah. Um, um, Jan wants to know when um, you and your colleagues and sort of volunteers aren't there, who is it that staffs the village, and is there sort of any provision for medical training? Um, the, the 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 doctor in charge is usually a a, 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 a Christian mission society um, appointee, so it's it she's there as a, in a missionary capacity, but all the other members of staff are local people so that the doctor who's there at the moment although she's not because she's home on furlough but then hasn't been allowed to go back because of covid so um, there are two med young medical officers who are, who are both fantastic um, but could do with the input of you know a qualified experienced doctor to further their training yeah. um, and and the other people who work there are all local but local in Uganda could mean that they've traveled a day to get there. Yeah. So often their shifts will be 24 hour shifts because it's, so they'll do a 24 hour shift and then they'll go home and then they'll come back. So, uh, you know, the distances they travel for, for work are enormous. Mm. But then some of the others live more locally. Um, some of them will carry on working when they're heavily pregnant when they've just had their baby and they will bring somebody in maybe their sister who will look after their young sister who will look after the baby while they're working and then they just pop into a little room to breastfeed whenever the baby needs it so it's a yeah it's um, um quite a margaret wants to know if fgm exists in uganda which i think it, i think that's female genital mutilation that's right it, it doesn't in the south of the country mm -hmm. um because it's it um it's very much associated with the the more northern African countries, Somalia, um, parts of Ethiopia. Uh, so it's not a, a, a problem, certainly in Kisoro. Okay. But there is possibly a, a, an issue with refugees coming from the Congo right. and from other countries. Okay. But I've not seen I've not seen any of it um, while I've been down there. Okay. And how long does each trip usually last that you go for? Is it the two weeks? It's two weeks, yes. I mean, it, it's probably a good two days travelling, mm -hmm. really. Um, we go, we leave Manchester Airport uh, around about six o'clock in the morning via and fly via Amsterdam or Brussels 
to Kigali, which is in northern Rwanda, which is the nearest airport. And then it's a four to five hour um, minibus journey. Mm -hmm. um, the flight itself is about nine hours. So um, yeah, we leave here at six in the morning and we get to Rwanda in the evening. We stay overnight in Kigali and we travel up to uh, Kisora the following morning, get there about sort of early afternoon. Okay, um, um, and then just a final couple of questions. So how much does it cost to fund a midwife at the village? And also is the village in need of donations at the moment? Um, uh, it costs between 1,800 and 2,000 pounds to fund a midwife, which seems ridiculous because, um, you know, midwives earn that a month here. Mm. Um, and the funding that, I, I did funding for this last year and we raised 2,200 2, pounds. Um, but that funding is running out at the end of this year, which is why um, I've, I've started fundraising again. Um, the Friends of Potter's Village, which is the sort of the fundraising arm of the charity, which is based up here in, in the Northwest in Stockport, um, fundraises for all aspects of Potter's work, but because they were primarily set up to fund the crisis centers, so that is, the, the houses where the babies are, to make sure that those babies are given a good start, that they are returned to their extended families or fostered or whatever, and that they are supported during their childhood. So that's the, the main aim of fundraising. But of course, to provide the, 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 the means to staff and supply a medical center also requires money. Mm -hmm. So they are always sort of fundraising for all aspects of the work there. But this is something quite specific and almost a bit separate to the main, you know, the main focus of the work there. But I feel that a midwife is so absolutely integral to outcomes for mothers and babies in that part of Uganda. Mm. Marika, can I just come in here? Um, I think you are uh, particularly keen to raise some specific uh, um, money for a, a midwife, aren't you? Yes. yes. Um, I think the best way, if anybody watching this is interested, um, and you know, uh, it would be amazing, amazing if you were. I have actually set up a GoFundMe page. Have you? Yeah. So um, it's simply called um, a midwife for Potter's Village. So okay, fine. Um, I wasn't um, sure about that because when we talked before, you hadn't. Uh, you know, you, you, yeah. you were doing it a okay. bit more personally. But um, if you wanted to put details of that onto Super Troopers, then obviously that's fine with me. And um, okay. you know, whatever's easiest for you, really. Um, I'm, I'm just keen that uh, you know anybody out there who feels um, moved to uh, to do something uh, to support it will be able to do that. So. Um, you know, do, do feel free to put that onto Super Troopers because I think it's a really, uh, really worthwhile thing to do. Um, Mary Kay, I all I've got to do is the very great pleasure of thanking you. That was absolutely brilliant. It's such a good way for us to start the Trisha Talk process. Um, and you, you know, you, you are a perfect example of the kind of thing that I'm talking about, something that you are passionate about, that's driven from something deep within you, which is obviously to, uh, which is obviously to be supportive and helpful, particularly to mothers and uh, in that in that wonderful time when you're uh, you know anti and postnatal which uh, I'm sure we can all remember those of us who've had children so you know you you've obviously been an amazing midwife throughout your life and this uh, this work that you're now doing with potters is just an extension of uh, of that care that you've uh, as I say that you've given to other yes. mothers yeah that's it it's absolutely brilliant. So thank you so much. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed that as much as I did. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. So thank you. Thank you very My much. And I'm going to say goodbye to all the rest of you. Um, I think we're meeting again. Gosh, I'm going to get this terribly wrong. But next week, we've got Robin Ellis, and then we've got the film club. So don't forget that. And I should look forward to, uh, to seeing lots of you for um, for those occasions as well. Uh, so again, thank you very much, Marika. My pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been absolutely lovely, not a bit scary. Good. Well done. And bye-bye, everybody else. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.